Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for my voice. I tried to apply auto here, but it made things worse. And this was the only joke that I will make, and it was a bad one. So, as you have mentioned, I work with Erlang Solutions as a consultant uh, in the last four or five years uh, solely on uh, RabbitMQ. And my day job is to talk to people and companies about their RabbitMQ problems or RabbitMQ uh, um, aspirations and help them achieve it. And one common theme that I um, that comes up all the time is uh, that really nobody wants to lose a message, and uh, yet a lot of people do, and that's when they usually um, reach out to us and uh, ask uh, what they can do differently. And since uh, everybody enjoyed their coffee break and cakes, let's do a bit of exercise. Uh, who uses RabbitMQ? Almost everyone. Great. Who doesn't want to lose a message? Good. So here's what you should do. Use a three-node cluster, not one, not two, not four, maybe five. We'll talk about that later. Set your partition handling to pose minority. If you don't know where to, uh, to do that, Google. Use quorum queues, not classic queue mirroring, quorum queues or streams. Use publish confirm, as uh, Adam mentioned uh, previously, it's uh, very important and use many acknowledgement on the, uh, on the consumer end, and uh, probably you can avoid 99.9% .9 of the problems. So let's see um, a couple of things about uh, these recommendations. First of all, let's uh, tackle confirms and acknowledgements, uh, because that's the easy low-hanging fruit. Uh, you should use them uh, on, the pub sorry, on the publisher end, uh, when you send a message to RabbitMQ, wait for a confirmation. If you don't receive a confirmation, you send the message as fire and forget, basically. On the consumer end, don't just let RabbitMQ send you a message. Make sure that uh, you acknowledge the message back to RabbitMQ, telling Rabbit that you have taken care of the message, it can easily forget about it, and if that message is lost, it's no longer Rabbit's problem. So, in this talk, I'd like to focus on uh, three main questions. Why a three-node cluster is recommended? And again, why not one, two, four, and uh, other numbers? Why pose minority and not some other kind of partition healing technology? And why quorum queues? Because yes, uh, Nevis is coming, new Revit versions are coming, or everything is improving, but uh, some legacy still stick with us, and uh, it's better to know about uh, how it works then, then not. So let's start with something easy, a single node cluster with a single queue. Um, this queue is a hypothetical queue, this is not classic, this is not quorum, this is a queue in a queuing system, and we will investigate what needs to happen in RabbitMQ for this queue to behave uh, uh, in a way that we don't lose our messages. So. Uh, if this RabbitMQ node can survive, the, survive a node restart, and the queue is durable enough that it survives the node restart, and the messages in that queue are persistent enough that they survive a node restart, then a single node cluster is the easiest solution out there. It's not highly available. While it's not in operational, you can't really send messages through it, but at least it remains consistent, and it doesn't lose your messages. So here's the problem. We want something better than a single node because we want high availability. So we introduce at least another node into the, into the cluster. And uh, let's discuss the two node setup. So we have two RabbitMQ nodes. We cluster them together. We don't set anything at the moment. Uh, but we create a queue of our hypothetical queue um, with a leader and a follower. So it's the same queue. If we publish something into this queue, it appears on both sides. And as long as everything works, no problem. Now what happens if we lose the network connectivity? There's some co uh, kind of communication issue, for example. This is the problem. This is really a problem because how RabbitMQ is programmed is it, it needs to make a decision at a point. And this is what we will talk about today. So this decision is on this node, this particular one, do we think that the other node 
is alive or dead. And let me demonstrate uh, how we can figure it out. So we are in this room. There's another conference going on in the other rooms. And I can ask them, hey, Alexei guys, are you there? And then we wait. And if nobody comes in, uh, through that door or shouts out, then we just don't know. So Alexei guys, are you there? And no answer. So are they still there or they just went home or eat all the cake and then went home? We just don't know. So we need to assume, let's assume that they are alive for the sake of uh, argument, but for our RabbitMQ node, it's the same thing. So this node at a point realizes that I lost connection with the other side. What can I do? It needs to do something, otherwise not a lot of <laughs> good things come out of this discussion. Uh, so let's see what it can do. It can completely ignore this problem. This is your default RabbitMQ behavior as of now. So what it does is it ignores the problem, assumes that whatever is on the other side, I don't care. The leader continues to be the leader on that node, so it accepts messages. This leader, or this fo um, follower, promotes itself into a leader, because if we can't communicate with the other side, this side needs to do something useful, and as a follower, it needs to do something better than being a follower. So it just promotes itself. Can anybody see a problem with this setup? Now we have two independent side, sides that cannot share information. Communication is broken. So the two sides will create a split brain situation. We have two independent RabbitMQ sub parts of a cluster, also known as partitions. And these two partitions will behave exactly the same way, exactly the same RabbitMQ. If we had messages in these queues, then those messages will be available on both sides. If we had two different kinds of clients connecting to the two different sides, then we will read the same messages on both ends, and so forth. So a lot of mm, different kinds of problems. And uh, what happens next is that when the network partition goes away, and Rabbit just ignore the situation, then nobody does anything. So we will end up with two leaders that are, have two different uh, sides of the same coin, and they don't really try anything to reconcile the situation. It's up to the operator. Not great. We don't recommend ignore partition handling. So what's the next one? What can we do? Our main uh, argument was that we need to make an assumption, and that assumption is that uh, we assume when there's an, a communication problem is that the other side is uh, not available. So if we can't communicate with the other side, then we will do the right thing and do something about this situation. So we will promote ourselves to a leader, but we actually made an assumption here that the other side is dead. But what if the other side is not dead? Then we ended up with, with exactly the same situation. Now let me go back. If the other side is actually dead, this is the correct behavior. We wanted high availability, we got high availability, assuming that the other side is not operable. Not just we can't communicate with it from this side of the equation, but the other side is really not there, not moving, not changing state. So in one use case, a very valid use case, we have the correct behavior. Same algorithm creates a split brain. So far, so good. So what is the solution? Uh, the assumption was that the other side is either dead or, the la dead or, or alive, and we really need to make a, a decision. Rabbit just can't sit there and do nothing, or uh, Rabbit developers needed to make a decision for, um, for us, and uh, that decision needs more information. So what we need is somebody has to tell us what to do, tell these poor Rabbit MQs what to do. And again, uh, when we look at this situation from your end, or my end, 
we actually have more information because you, all of you, can see both sides of the cluster, of the same cluster. This RabbitMQ node doesn't know what's going on there, and this RabbitMQ node doesn't know what's going on there. So we have more information. This is where a lot of arguments come in that, uh, but clearly, we could make a good decision in this case. So uh, to ease the situation, we need a third party. We introduce a third node into the cluster. Uh, again, just reinforcing, we are still talking about hypothetical queues, not classic, not quorum. If any kind of queue solution we put in, it would behave exactly the same way. So we introduce a third node into the cluster, and uh, top one, left and right, depending on which side we are on the screen. And uh, this way, we change the equation, and that uh, change is significant. From the perspective of a single node, like this one, or that one, or that one, but just focusing on a single node, that node can make a, a correct, always correct decision only on local information. And that question is, am I part of a majority partition of the cluster? Am I part of the majority? In a cluster of any size, there is only one majority. No matter uh, how many nodes are in that cluster. Even in a two-node cluster, there's a majority of two nodes. In a three-node cluster, you can't have two majorities. That would be a bit bigger cluster. So again, this decision can be made locally, and it's always yeah. correct. So what we can do is, if we introduce a network partition, I s partition the leader node just for the sake of it, then the leader node can evaluate the situation. Am I part of the majority uh, of the partition? The answer is no. Both follower nodes can make a decision. Am I part of the majority of the partition independently from each other without asking anything else? And the answer is yes and yes. So what they will do is that the follower nodes will just carry on as normal, while the other node, which was in the minority, stops itself voluntarily and properly. It's no state change, and no state change is good in a situation like this, because if, if it doesn't change state, it cannot go bad, at least. It's not improving. Mm, the business might not be happy about it, but it's a good decision, technically. So on the other side, now we can, once we figured out that we are part of the majority, we can negotiate, and these two queues can decide whose father is stronger, and uh, eventually one will win, and we will have a leader and a, a follower, and this situation is still good. It's still consistent. We can still talk to this node and reliably figure out what, um, what we need to do and what we want to do. Yeah. Now let's address the elephant in the room, amnesia. So far, I have not said any word about amnesia. Amnesia is... Uh, the meta storage part of RabbitMQ. You can read a bit more about that. It's a database, it's, uh, it provides asset guarantees, not important. This is where the meta, mm, uh, metadata lives about topology, like queue metadata or stream metadata at the moment. When Capri comes, things will change, but uh, the argument will be still valid, by the way. Uh, exchanges, bindings, uh, all those sorts of things live in amnesia. Mm -hmm. Uh, cl some part of the clustering information, what forms a cluster, uh, it's quite ha mm, mm, baked in, so it's very difficult to change. And some plugins actually use it, so uh, once Capri is gone, uh, sorry, once Amnesia is gone and Capri is in, which is the good, mm, good case, then some plugins may stop working, so they need to be updated as well. So now that we know everything about Amnesia, uh, let us let me make another controversial statement. When we talk about split brains or network partitions or partitioned rabbit MQ that's completely broken and now the business is on fire and everybody is on a long uh, emergency call and uh, trying to figure out how to restore the situation, it's not amnesia that broke the system. 
It's the network partition and our inability, inability to make the correct decision on uh, what is the good state of the cluster. Not who's the leader, who's the follower, but what is a good state. So for example, this is not a good state. If something like this is committed to amnesia, then amnesia will report that, uh, sorry, I can't reconcile the situation, something needs to be done, and it's up to you, the developer, in this case the Revit developers, to come up with the right algorithm. But I guarantee you the Revit developers don't know what's in your queues and which side you want to keep. So they can't make a decision for us. And this is where uh, Amnesia will report that it's in, in a running partition and uh, you need to do something about it. Now if you use pause minority, then this cannot happen because this side does not and ever changes state once it's stopped. So with pause minority, Amnesia always remains consistent all our queues remain consistent to a certain degree, regardless whether they are classical uh, quorum. They should be quorum, by the way. And uh, all minority members stop automatically. Now, this last sentence is, uh, ha has a lot of consequence. If you only have just minority members, because your cluster broke to multiple small pieces, then the whole cluster is stopped. You can't serve any request because it's not safe to do so unless you are happy with losing messages eventually. So it's a whole circle. So, so far we covered via three node cluster, via pose minority. I see some nodding, so I assume that you are convinced that these are the right solutions. Now I'd like to talk a bit about quorum queues because uh, they make our life a bit more complicated and easier, but my life definitely more complicated. So each quorum queue defines its own cluster. I leave the definition of a cluster muddy, but think about it as each of your quorum queues are their own clusters living in the same rabbit cluster somewhere. Uh, it uses the REF protocol under the hood. Um, streams use very similar algorithm to the REF protocol, but they don't use the same library. It doesn't really matter. They are both behave the same way from mm, this point of view, and uh, they are all good. Uh, the minority members of a mm, queue are inoperable. They refuse any commitment. They are still there. They are still running. They may not respond to your requests. Mm, they take it in, into an internal buffer, but they are still there and still running. They just don't commit. Basically, they don't change state. And uh, the majority acknowledging a request is enough for the whole quorum queue cluster to move forward. Basically, if you publish a message in a three node cluster, two nodes acknowledges, then the queue will accept that message and it's safe. So you don't lose messages. And cluster member change requires a majority. And this is uh, something very important. So I put the two main parts at the beginning, at the end, let's say, let's say by design. Uh, each quorum queue is on cluster. And the cluster member change requires a majority, which means that uh, if you end up with a quorum queue with only the minority, and you cannot really recover any mo anything else, then uh, your only choice is to s scale down that cluster manually on command line on 3.12 or later to a single node, lose all the rest that you have, and uh, grow that cluster back up again uh, as you can. But you need the majority. If you only have the minority, you cannot just say, hey, add this add an, uh, other node to this cluster, and uh, now they will make up the numbers. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. So with quorum queues, now we have uh, the correct uh, way of working. And in a three node cluster with a quorum size of three, this case is happy path. Not for the operator's team because they need to figure out what the heck is going on with this node and resurrect it. But from RabbitMQ's point of view, this state is happy path just as good as uh, having three nodes all operational. And this is where 
the difference is important between a cluster and a quorum cluster, or a quorum queue, for example. And to demonstrate that, we can't really do that with a three node, or we could, but it's kind of meaningless. Let's uh, grab a five node cluster, because five is another odd number, it's not four, so we can uh, form a majority by, uh, and majority of three by losing three, uh, two nodes. So if we would forget about the queues, the internal queue boxes, then uh, we could have a consistently working uh, um, cluster with only three nodes out of the five. If we lose a third one, then everything stops. So this design pattern was very popular with classic queues. You had a large cluster, you set up uh, um, HA exactly two or exact exactly three, and let uh, everything uh, just uh, do its own magic. Uh, wait probably half a year and the peak load and the network partition and you lo lost half of your queues, but at a to a point it worked. So what's the problem with this? Now the problem is that, uh, as I said, you could lose two of these nodes, let's say these two, and everything would work, mm -hmm. but what would happen if you would lose these two nodes? Now the cluster is happy, because it can form a majority. Uh, the queues are not really happy because uh, this side of the cluster is on the minority side. So we can't really use the same logic that we used before when I said that if we have a, a third party, then locally we can make the correct decision always. We could still do that, but now we have a clash. Do we prefer the cluster to survive or do we prefer the queue to survive? And that all depends on our assumption, which is, is the other side alive or dead? So if we use pose minority, like as I recommended, even with five nodes, then these two nodes would stop. And if this is a quorum queue, then that quorum queue would be stuck in a not available state. It wouldn't accept any new request. It's a, it's a minority. So really, Good follow-up question is, can we just add an extra two nodes there? And the answer is uh, not really, because cluster change requires a majority for a quorum queue, but that limitation is there to save us, because what would happen if these two sides would remain alive for some reason? Let's say post minority doesn't kick in, or you want to live dangerously and use auto heal or ignore partition handling instead of pose minority, then the quorum queue on this side would carry on as normal, and then you would create a new leader there, two new followers, and back to split brain. And this situation can uh, happen, this kind of cluster setup can happen not by design but by accident if you do, for example, auto scaling. So you had a three node cluster, you started scaling, you had a network partition, and then what to do at that point. So there are no real good decisions to make, at least not from Rabbit's point of view. It's all, it depends. It depends on what, uh, what the operator wants, but Rabbit cannot read minds yet. Uh, so we'll see how that, uh, uh, that will pan out. And there's another consequence uh, in this setup, which is, uh, what if you would declare another queue on this side of the cluster? You would need to put that queue somewhere, that metadata at least, and that needs to be consistent. Because if you would declare that queue on the minority side, then once that minority side is uh, restarted, all that data is dropped, because uh, that's the only way to come back to a healthy state for RabbitMQ. Now that's a limitation of amnesia then uh, basically that queue declaration would disappear and your declared queue would disappear. So that's again a case that we don't want. So use pose minority and uh, try not to do this uh, uh, big cluster small mirroring pattern. If you have five nodes, mirror to all five. And just a side note, if you have a three node cluster mirroring with, uh, onto three nodes, 
and then you extend it to five node, mirroring to five nodes, expect that the performance will be less, not more. Because you ask Rabbit to do more. So it cannot perform as, ba uh, as good. So as we have seen, all of these leads to dead ends, quite a lot of them. So if we try to be clever, we don't really go with the, the right design with RabbitMQ, then uh, eventually we hit walls, uh, never leave this um, pretty nice maze. Uh, even the right algorithm will not take you out. So now what? So what is the solution? Extend mirroring to all nodes, set partition handling to pose minority, and deal with the consequences. It will not behave as your five-year-old RabbitMQ on 3.6 and 3.7, that's for sure. It will behave better, more consistent, but you can't have just two nodes, you can't have uh, all of these nice things. Except if you find somebody who's better than uh, Rabbit itself, and that is usually the operator. So I'd like to pose the question, can we decide whether the other side is alive or dead? And what I said is Rabbit cannot, but we in the audience, we can. The operator can. The operator may be able to uh, stand in in the role of uh, the third node and just decide that, uh, okay, this one uh, I like, that one is not healthy, let's kill it, because uh, they have a way to sneak into that part of uh, um, the network partition and stop that node, or just stop the whole data center completely and move to a new data center. All of these decisions can be made by real humans with brain, not an algorithm. And then it leads us to solutions like these, where we can put active and passive nodes into a cluster uh, made by Erlang Solutions and our team. And uh, you can do all the kinds of things that I told you not to do and not to do. And yeah, I told you that you can do this. You can still do that. And you can do five node clustered with three plus two and any other combination that makes sense. So if we involve an operator, then uh, everything is possible. So if you are interested in that, um, find us after the talk. Yes, the time is a bit limited, but uh, you can always reach me at least. So thank you very much for listening. Remember, what you need to do is renote cluster, pose minority, quorum queues, or streams. Don't use um, classic queue mirroring anymore. If you use it and you struggle getting away from it, again, get in touch. And uh, use published confirms and manual acknowledgments and good client libraries. Thank you very much.